ただいまから、はいえー、第5 We would like to now start the fifth academic baby wearing conference. For the first time, we are conducting this conference online. There may be some glitches as we are still learning the ropes, and we ask in advance for your understanding. You may have received the abstract already. Which reads the fourth academic baby wearing conference instead of the fifth. This was a typo that surprised us all, and we do stand corrected. Today, we are going to consider baby wearing from a scientific standpoint. But before we go into details, let me briefly share with you our history and background. First of all, There are many definitions for baby wearing. The definition, in a very narrow sense, would center around these three statements as shown here. As a part of our efforts to raise awareness about baby wearing, We have hosted and directed a number of activities. Baby Wearing Lab Japan was founded in 2010, and from around 2012, we started hosting research related activities and events. We started to use the name Baby Wearing Conference since 2016. You can see in this chart the events that we have hosted so far. We hold academic conferences once every two years. In between, we host events entitled Technique focused on learning the skills. As I have mentioned earlier of the typo in the agenda that this is the fourth conference, but actually October 2018 was the third conference, and we skipped to count the last year's event, which was baby wearing technique. So this year's event is actually the fifth conference. Our apologies once again. We will not send out the updated version of the abstract, so we hope you will kindly forgive us and make the correction on your copy. A bit more on our past activities. In 2014, we hosted two events, especially this second event was my personal highlight, a magical event. We were fortunate that Professor Blandine Brill, the famous anthropologist from France, happened to have been. In Japan during the conference period, and she kindly accepted our invitation. We also benefited from the presence of Dr. Kuroda Kumi. Dr. Kuroda researched about transport response. We also had the pleasure of hearing from Professor Tsutaya. She presented about her research on ancient teeth to determine how long babies were nursed. In the 2016 event, we had keynote presentation by Professor Kuniyoshi. In 2017, we held for the first time our academic baby wearing conference technique event. This was held in Tokyo and in Osaka with a total of 200 people participating. As a related event, at Shizuoka University, we held lectures as mentioned here. We asked Professor Kawada, the anthropologist, to talk about how to build and use the body and posture. And today, we are happy to be hosting the fifth ABC, ABC 2020. To kick off the conference, we have the pleasure. Of welcoming Professor Enomoto Mika from the Tokyo University of Technology School of Media Science. Professor Enomoto will present for approximately 50 minutes, followed by QA session for about 10 minutes. 
Without further ado, I am handing it over to Professor Enomoto. Thank you very much. I think I'm supposed to share my screen. I hope I am sharing my slide here. Okay. Let me get started. My name is Enomoto Mika from the Tokyo University of Technology. Nice to meet you all. Ms. Sonoda kindly invited me, but I wanted to warn you that my specialty is somewhat different. I specialize in psychology, and when I learned how to swim, I wrote a paper on that experience. And Ms. Sonoda asked me if I can talk to you about it, hence I am here today. This is me pictured here about one and a half years after I started taking swimming lessons, I went to Cebu Island in the Philippines. These photos were taken during that trip. Since I don't get to go there now, I'm feeling nostalgic looking at these photos. This was taken at a place called Oslob in Cebu Island. This is a whale shark. There was a packaged tour that let you swim with whale sharks. As you have seen in the previous photo, I have goggles and used a breathing tube and was able to swim around as well as above and below the whale shark. It was very soothing to see them. Fishes were so effortless, swimming with no extra tensions or force. For a swimming learner like myself, these fishes were the ultimate examples to emulate. Looks like I stopped the slideshow. Let me try it again. Now today's objectives, or rather, the objectives of my research were as follows. To construct a model of how human beings harmonize with the material world and learn embodied skills in a way that leverages physical laws. In the process of communicating embodied skills, how the learner makes sense of the linguistic representation and its relationship with the physical moves and the laws of the material world. Here I have used the four-character word, zenshu tongue meaning reaching sudden enlightenment by gradual learning. This is how practicing every day will lead to one day understanding what you need to do. And eventually, for the members of this organization, because baby wearing is a very delicate physical skill, I hope I will be able to provide you with an insight or steps to consider your baby wearing practices. This slide is actually the last page of my slide deck, but I thought I might as well talk about it up front. And today I'm going to have a lengthy talk about how I learned how to swim, and I have picked up some insights that could also be applied when considering baby wearing techniques. For example, here are some statements that you often hear from your swimming coaches. Staring at hundreds of photos will not make you a better swimmer. You get it one day if you practice long enough. You must be thinking that you should kick this way, or you must be thinking this way, comments from your perspective, so to speak, and they say, but in fact, it must be that way. That's from their perspective. And also, please practice every day during the week, otherwise you will forget, right? By forget, the coach meant my body will forget it. You remember verbally, but you will forget the feeling. Also, I heard often, oh, you got it now, didn't you? Coaches say this from looking at me because they thought that I got it. They are saying this because they use their imagination to determine what was going on in my head. Also, I often hear, you are at your best today. This is to say that by looking at me swimming, they could tell that I was at my best. Now, the last one needs some background information for you to understand. 
But when I tell them that I successfully did a trick after watching a video, they could hardly believe it. They asked me if it was because I was able to do a backflip, I was able to do a new swimming trick, and they finally understood. The conclusion here is that the teaching is meaningless unless it is truly based on the somatic sensations of the instructor. No matter what it says in textbooks, this form and that movement, you cannot just repeat it unless you have really understood it. And in teaching, first-person perspective, as in this is how I feel, and second-person perspective, as in this is how you feel, are important. Textbooks are in third-person perspective, so they are very objective. These perspectives are often too objective that we can't really understand what it is trying to convey. Today, I would like to base my talk on these premises. This is a passage by Nakai Shoichi, a scholar in aesthetics. I did not know about him until I read his works in preceding studies. This passage was written around the time he was learning swimming, and it is about the process of arriving at the aesthetic state. He goes, when practicing swimming, for the mastery of crawl strokes, studying hundreds of photos is useless. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? It is only after a long period of practice does one realize being able to swim with ease, as if one is floating in the water, totally relaxed. For the first time, did I feel totally relaxed, letting go of myself in the water, I started to feel inexplicably relaxed and to enjoy myself. This is a very state of beauty, the aesthetic state. My body found the form, the rule as to how things should be. I found my true self. This is what he wrote, and I am training every day, aiming at arriving at such a state. The whale sharks of Oslov that I have mentioned earlier seemed very relaxed. They seemed very soothing. They were not swimming out of intention. Rather, they were swimming as if they were breathing. That's why they were extremely gracious to watch. This is a text by Zeami from the 1400s. Zeami is the author of the famous Fushi Kaden. This passage was written around the same period and is from one of his treatises on no theater entitled The True Path to the Flower. Zeami is the founder of no theater, so naturally this passage covers the topic of no. It goes, in terms of this art, Mushufu, or style without mastery, is to be despised, means it's no good. This point must be fully understood. First, if an actor is born with a proper natural character and gifted with talent, he can surely become a master. This means when one is born with natural talent, then it's good, indeed. I continue to quote, as he polishes and practices his art, his natural abilities will manifest themselves of their own accord. This means as you keep on studying and learning, the abilities will naturally start to show. In dancing and chanting, an actor is mushifu when he is still imitating what he has learned from his teacher. On the surface, the imitation may be effective, but the artistic powers will be insufficient, and his real skill will not increase. Such is the actor who remains at the level of mushifu, non-mastery. This means when you are still imitating, you are still at the stage of non-mastery, meaning that the master is not in yet. A real master is one who imitates his teacher well, assimilates and absorbs his art into his mind and body, and arrives at the level of perfect fluency through a mastery of his art. This means after learning from the teacher, the learner needs to make the content one's own. Then the state becomes ushifu, or state with mastery, written as the master is within. Now, fast forward to the present day, a professor of Keio University, Professor Sua, came up with the concept of embodied metacognition. The words, which are symbols, all the words that one uses, need to be accompanied by taikan or embodied sensation. 
What is Taikan? It's a coined word and is defined as a form of proprioception, the totality of signals that go through the body originated by the interconnected moves of the muscles, tendons and ligaments, and so on, which was triggered by the movement of the body. It may be easier for you to understand if you look at the diagram here. This is how the symbol cat is perceived through embodied sensation. You have the tone of voice, the psychological aspect like not letting the guards down, whiskers, coat of fur, slow moving. There is a network of a variety of words that make up the concept of cat. So there are many ways of representation. And these are always accompanied by the embodied sensation. For example, very soft to touch and fluffy coat of fur, thick and straight whiskers, tingly, bending, round eyes. Well, this is visual, but you may feel drawn in. So only by having such connections do the words start to have meanings. Even if you were to coin a new word, an embodied sensation related to cat needs to be at the root. I think this will give us some insight. Based on this diagram, I came up with a model of the things that I have learned in swimming. This is pretty complicated. The vertical and network structure is coming from Professor Sua's diagram. Here you have representations, group of words. These are the words and teachings that I have encountered in the process of learning how to swim. Stronger first kick, stamp with your armpits, get back to the streamlined position, and so many others. These are what my coaches said to me. And my coach, who is an expert, a skilled individual of this sport, uses his embodied physical perception to teach, such as do as if you are on a balance ball, go as if you are going through a tunnel, or go with the water. So the coach tries to teach how to achieve such feelings as felt by himself. Furthermore, he teaches the movements that he does to generate such feelings, for example, push the water, keep the streamlined position, roll the body, and so on. By moving the body, for example, by rolling the body, there will be less water resistance and it becomes easier to advance in the water. So you are initiating an action to the water. That means the swim is generated based on the relationship between the water and the motion, which leads to the perception. And he represented that by the word. And the learner has no clue what goes on behind that representation, so what he or she can do is to try to decipher the word uttered by the skilled individual. And eventually, I came up with this model. So so this is the conclusion of the analysis, which I am going to discuss now. Now, what can we find after mastery? I have some quotes. The first two are from surfers. The first one is from Duke Kahanamoku. He is known as the father of surfing. This is written in Hawaiian language. It translates, be one with the flow, with the water. Do not resist and go with the flow. So it is not like you are going to get on the wave. It's not like that. And Gary Lopez also said, flow with it, be part of it. And... Coach Fujiwara, my coach, said things like this. So it's related to swimming, snuggle with the water as if you are going through a tunnel in the water. If you break the tunnel as you proceed, the water will resist you. So they are all saying somewhat similar things.
These are the things that I would like to learn. In this first-person study, I was the only subject in this study. In my process of acquiring swimming skills, how I acquired the somatic sensations is what I am going to discuss. Here are the supporting materials. I am a psychologist, so normally I would conduct experiments, collect data from around 20 to 30 subjects, and make statistical analysis and come up with a conclusion. This has been the standard process of my works in university, but I got rid of all that for this study, and I will only rely on my memo or notes. And this first-person study is a reflective study. And I was only able to come up with this methodology. I made two memos or notebooks. In the first notebook, I wrote down everything I learned each time. Basically, I wrote down everything my coach said. After the training session, I wrote them all down. I used waterproof notepad. Here, I wrote down, bend my knee when kicking, lift my leg from the thigh, use my abdominal muscle, and so forth. I also made a notebook for documenting my self-training sessions. This notepad had dates, like a calendar agenda. I wrote down what I did for practice every day and some ideas for improvement. Here I wrote plan one, plan two for improvement, kick to get back to streamlined position, accelerate the timing for faster speed. So I wrote down ideas for improvement in a diary format. These were the basis of my study. This is pretty complicated, but I wrote down physical moves and utterances, and these are the symbols. In the brackets are the direct quotes of what my coach said. I sometimes summarize what my coach said, so I wrote down the summary without using brackets. I used double angle brackets for partial quotes. Physical moves are in round brackets, and special terminologies are in bold brackets. Sorry, this is the same thing. Now I am going to discuss butterfly stroke. The reviewer of my paper did not have proper swimming experience, so I was asked to explain how to execute the butterfly stroke first. So I came up with this diagram. I got the images from Kotobank. Basically, two kicks are performed every stroke cycle to propel the body, first kick and second kick. In the first kick, you use your knee down and kick like this, and your body becomes straight. This is called the streamline position. From this position, catch-pull positions are performed with the arms, and when the momentum of the arm is at the largest, the second kick is performed. That will move you forward. Then bring your arms above the water, bring them forward to complete the recovery phase. So this is the textbook explanation. Mr. Aso Yoshihiro, I found this channel when I went on YouTube. His explanations were easy to understand. He called it Dombrako Butterfly. Dombrako is an onomatopoeia for floating. According to his channel, you sink in with the first kick. Then you come horizontal with the streamline position. Then with the second kick, you pull while going upward. Then that will bring your head above the water for easy breathing. After watching this video, I tried it in the pool and I somehow succeeded. I was able to swim 25 meters. That was my very first try at swimming butterfly. At that stage, I still did not quite understand what was going on, and this is what I wrote down then. First of all, I did not achieve full rotation of the arm. I think I was too slow that I could not complete the arm motion while I was floating.
Second issue was that my shoulder stayed in the water the entire time. It's extremely difficult to rotate the shoulder like this in the water, so you are supposed to lift it above the water, but I was not doing it. So I pondered on the causes. First one was the trajectory of the rotation of the arm. Second, it could be the timing. It could be the strength of my arm or my catch and pull were performed at wrong moments or perhaps my kicks were too weak. So I thought of many causes, but I was doing it by myself and I could not figure out what was the right thing to do. So I decided to work with a coach. I decided to take swimming lessons. It cost me 3,000 yen for 30 minutes. It was for a fee. I decided to go for it. My first lesson was on the 18th of December 2018. How to kick, how to crawl, the right rhythm. These were the three things that I learned that day. First of all, my coach asked me to float face down. This is called prone float, and I was told to kick, so I tried it. Then my coach held my legs and said, you are thinking you are doing this, you are swinging your legs down, right? What he meant was that I was trying to really kick it, so I was bringing my legs too deep, and as a result, my upper body was bending upward. But my coach said, in fact, you should do it this way. So it had to be shallower. Rather than kicking the water downward, you do it as if you are sending the water backward. You use the muscle at the back of your thigh. That's what I was told. Also, I was instructed to point my toes and to push the water when I am fully extended. I was advised to go pigeon-toed to gain the surface, and when I kick, I tend to lean forward, so I was told to stamp with my armpits. Yes, I did wonder what my coach meant by that, but I wrote it down anyway. Stamp with your armpits. If your arms are too drawn, you cannot stamp it. So did my coach mean to stamp it like this? Well, I did not get it. Draw means like this, so if it is this way, you cannot stamp it. So that was the meaning, but I did not understand it at that time. But this is what my coach often says. And my arms must be touching my temples at all times, like this, and it has to be flat and parallel to the water surface. So I should not move it and should maintain the same rhythm. As for kicks, first kick is stronger, second kick is weaker. As for the arms, I must do as if I am on a balance ball. So the form must look like this. That's what I thought. And elevate the elbow and bring it straight down. And tighten the lower abdomen and use the thigh. Braking requires good timing. Just like bicycling or motorcycling, you will start to break way before the point where you want to stop. If you want to stop here, you cannot wait until you reach here to break. So you need to start breaking in advance. For recovery, squeeze the scapulae and lower the shoulders. Scapulae are the bones in the back. And relax and face forward, and the rhythm is supposed to be five times faster like this. Dun, dun, dun. These are the things I learned. It was only 30 minutes, but it was full of contents to learn. And now I would like to discuss the first person and second person perspectives. In the previous slide, I said that my coach said, you are thinking this way. This is the second person's view, the view of me from my coach. It is the second person conjecture. The coach looked at my movement and guessed how I must be feeling in order to generate such a movement. And the coach went, but it is supposed to be this way, while actually moving my legs. And at this point, I am guessing the coach's or the skilled person's perspective as to what the correct way must be. This process keeps repeating during the swimming lesson. 
And here, my legs are moved by the coach, so I am actually feeling many things in my legs, the distance, the strength, the direction. So during this limited time, I am cognizant of my body movement. And this stamping with the armpit, this was mentioned while we were practicing the kicks. Why was that? I am not sure. And the balance ball example, this is most likely an analogy of a certain somatic sensation, but was this the only way of conveying this sensation? Perhaps this analogy was making it even harder to grasp the right sensation. That's what I felt at that time. And the head should stay between the arms and should not move. This is called flat butterfly as opposed to the donburako butterfly, which I tried in the beginning. This is the technique used by Olympic swimmers. Normally, you do not teach beginners flat butterfly technique, but this coach's thinking was an exception, so the coach said, if you can do it, why not? But for me, I was able to breathe comfortably using the donbrako butterfly technique, so abandoning donbrako technique meant for me giving up swimming at 25 meter lap in one go. This happens quite often in learning physical skills. If you learn the wrong technique, you will need to abandon it. You will need the courage to abandon what you have learned. A sociologist, Marcel Moss, introduced the term habitus. He defined that bodily skills often have some sort of ingrained form or disposition. And once you are told that it is wrong, you will need to abandon those habits or inclinations or forms. Then you become incapable of doing anything. He wrote of the time when French and British armed forces jointly went to the battle. British soldiers needed to be given British-style guns, and the French soldiers, the French guns. This shows that even if the action to be executed is pretty much the same, slight differences can mean a lot, and in some cases you won't be able to do anything because of a slight difference. This is what you have to overcome. And then from the next day onwards, I trained, and these were the issues. First, my kicks. I am just scraping the water and I am not creating enough momentum. I try to do as I have learned, push water with my insteps, use the backs of my thighs to lift my legs, but I was not able to do these. So the following was the solution. My legs started to float after the first kick. The legs are relaxed, so naturally the legs start to float. So I thought I'd use that buoyancy to lift the leg for the second kick. My second issue was that I could not create forward momentum. My body was supposed to lean forward and move forward, but it didn't. And the tips or analogy given to me were to imagine stamping with my armpits or press the armpits against the water. And yes, if I move my armpits forward, my body moves slightly to the front as if I am sliding into the water. Then I realized that stamping with the armpits was actually an important analogy. <laughs> that was the realization during my practices. My third and fourth problems. Third problem was that if I am too focused on the arm movements, I cannot kick. So the movements were not at all coordinated. So what I needed to do was this. It will take too long if I try to recall all the tips. So I came up with a series of key words and phrases, like kick with thigh, stamp with armpit, balance ball, arms, lower the shoulder to rotate. So rather than remembering each moves one by one, I tried to recall the moves with key terms.
I continued with my lessons. The second lesson was on the 8th of January. I was taught similar things, such as balance is generated from kicks. Don't bend knees. I was told the same thing the previous time too. Arms and head must be kept shallow and must move horizontally. Use the muscle to minimize up and down movement. I was also told that the first kick is what generates propulsion in butterfly. My coach said how you do it is too slow. So my movements were too minute to create propulsion. Nobody can swim at this speed is what my coach said. And about recovery, this is putting the arms back to the original position. I was told that if the arms go behind the shoulders, the shoulders will be locked. They get stuck and won't rotate. So I had to push my chest forward like this and bend the bottom backward before rotating my arms. And I was not able to lift my arms too much, just like sliding them along with the surface of the water. That's the way to do it. I was also advised to imagine jumping the vaulting box and that my arms looked like that of a mantis. Actually, this is a common mistake in beginners. The coach was like, why are you making your arms look like that of a mantis? That is because I was trying to pull before bringing my arms to the front. My coach was strict and I was scolded many times. So put it in a schema, this is how recovery should look like. Arms should be moving just above the water surface. Then I had my third and fourth private lessons. Kicks, you should use the thighs, not just the knees. Your buttock must be showing above the water, like this angle. Upper body should be flat and full extension is needed after the kick. Second kick, you will be bending slightly backward. As for the arm movement, pull should be aimed at the legs but must not go behind the thighs. Once your hands reach the thighs, they have to be, be moving smoothly to the sides. My coach demonstrated to me how it should be done, like this is how you should do it. Once again, I was told to imagine myself on a balance ball. My coach uses this expression often. You lean to the water in front of you. Keep the elbows parallel to the water as if you are embracing the water. Slowly bring the water together with using the arms below the elbows. Recovery is done not with force but with reaction. Bring forward from the shoulder as slowly as possible. As for rhythm, my coach said, once the rhythm is disrupted, you cannot bring it back. So I have to be thorough and try not to disrupt my rhythm. And I was told to try it but because I was nervous and was fearful that I may drown. The rhythm kept on accelerating. I was told to slow down, but it was very difficult to do so. So I needed to stop once and I needed to do it over again. The coach said, at least you realize that in the middle. After each private lesson, my coach would give me tips on the kind of practices that I could do in between. My coach went, please practice every day at least for the first week because you forget things, don't you? Then I would quietly think, wait, no, I don't forget things. Well, sometimes I did object. I told my coach, I'm writing down everything you have said verbatim. But from my coach, it was apparent that I had forgotten many things. So my coach would say, but you did forget the other day, didn't you? Then I started to realize as I went through my learning journey, that the words are easy to memorize and I actually took notes so it was easy to remember. But the sensation of the body, as in when my coach held my legs and moved them, or when my coach approves of my moves, those were forgotten. That is why the body needs to be reminded of those sensations every day. That is why my coach asked me to practice every day.
And I did practice faithfully every day for one week. And there were certain things that I could not do right. For example, I was sinking after several strokes. So after 10 meters, I was sinking. So I needed to stop and stand in water. And the reason was my slow kick. Next page, please. My knees were bent, my buttock was getting out of the water after the first kick, I was kicking downwards. So these are the things I thought. And the solutions were I would be more careful with my streamline position, lift the legs straight upward after the recovery and kick, but I can't lift it straight up. And I move straight to armpit stamping position after the body is bent. I came up with a variety of solutions. The second problem was that I could not complete my arm rotation while breathing. When I breathe, I bring my head up, but I was doing it excessively and my arms were going upward. So I thought I needed to correct it. I recalled my coach saying that I needed to slide my arms in the water surface. Breathing should be done just like in breaststroke. I was able to do it in breaststroke, so I experimented it like this or that, but my face was not out of the water. Anyway, I tried different things. The third problem was that I was bending backwards too much before I came down, so I needed to be more straight more shallow. And came the fifth private lesson. My coach was like, that's too soon again. You're doing it wrong again. My first kick, if I go too strong and deep, my buttock will go up slightly. And the following is the basic for everything. Knees should not be bent. Use the hamstring muscles to extend the legs and lift and then bring down. Second kick should be soft. Buttocks should not be above the water. Knees should not be bent. Stretching after the first kick, it is called the dolphin kick. Your hip is elevated from the kick, so if your head is down, your body naturally goes down. And my coach said, Nishimoto-san, Nishimoto is my real name. This is your weakness. Your shoulder is too low. I needed to put my shoulders forward, not down, in order to move forward. As for the arms, leave the elbows and tighten the sides. Upper arms should be touching the sides of the chest. As for the rhythm, it should be slower. I had to count my breathing, how many times I exhaled. I should make it less. My coach said that my goal was 15 times. Moving on to the sixth private lesson, same things were pointed out this time too. Arms should be straight when I enter, keep them straight to get on the water, as if you wait a while after standing on the surfboard. My coach says, you wouldn't get off immediately after you stood, do you? Slightly bend the elbow, you cannot push if your arms are rigid straight, this doesn't work, so do it like this. And this one was said for the first time. My coach pointed to the water in front of me and asked if I can use water around here. There is water that follows your arms, no? And my reaction was like, really? Is there really? I was still not totally convinced, but my coach went, you got it right, didn't you? What you did now was the best. So I did not get what was good about it. And the rest of the corrections was about the same. And then, that same evening, while writing down the notes on my notepad, I started thinking about the corrections my coach gave me. Yes, perhaps I can use the water that stick to my arms. And then the concept of lift came to my mind. There is this concept in physics called lift. Thanks to this concept of lift, the airplane can float. Think of this as an airplane, and when the airplane goes up in the air, the air pressure above the plane is lower than the air pressure below it. 
Under such condition, the force of lift is in effect. And because of the object that is blocking the air, it is separated into two layers, the layer that flows smoothly and the other layer that doesn't. And the layer with less airflow will have less air coming in, so the pressure decreases, causing the object to rise to that layer. I started to recall studying this topic in university. Then it rang the bell. The arms while stroking are like the wings of the airplane. If they are too straight, the air will keep flowing to the sides. But if they are slightly bent, if it comes from here, it will stagnate here. And it will go above it too, so there is some water stagnating here that is building up. So when I can push this water, then this may be the water that sticks to you. So that's the thought that came about. This is the formula for calculating lift force. Lift equals half of the P, which is the air density, times V, which is true airspeed. And then the surface area of the object in the air times coefficient. That evening, I realized something. I had a revelation. Things that I could not understand suddenly started ringing the bell. First of all, the balance ball analogy. There is a balance ball here. This chunk of high-pressured water. I had thought that my coach meant I needed to make a posture of getting on the balance ball. But now I understood what my coach meant. And another statement of lean on the water in front of me, I understood that I lean on this chunk of water here. Also, the expression lift the elbow and hold it meant that you must see this water as a ball. If you consider this as water, you cannot hold it. And if your arms are straight, you cannot hold it. So you need to bend your arms. And about another statement, as if you grab the water that you were on, was the same. All these expressions were about this phenomenon. This is what I realized. And going back to this equation, the speed or velocity is related to the lift force. Remember my coach once said, if we go too slow, nobody can swim. The faster the velocity, the larger the lift force, so you can push more. If you are slower, the lift force is smaller, you don't have much to push, hence no momentum to swim. Here's another discussion. This is a different topic, but it's related to the expression by my coach, as if you are going through an underwater tunnel. If you are swimming with too much agitation, there will be more resistance force. There is the concept of pressure drag. What happens is you are blocking the entire flow of water in front of you then there is no force to leverage. On the other hand, if you swim with least resistance, water around you, above and below, will flow smoothly. So there will be less pressure drag. And when I thought about it after I have acquired this skill, I realized that it meant to break the tunnel and that it meant to go through the tunnel. So when my coach said it, I had no idea what he meant, and one day it finally made sense. And now going back to the initial diagram, During the period that I have not had a full understanding, I could not see it. I did not get what it meant to stamp with my armpit, for example. Balance ball? Is it about the posture? This part, somatic sensation, was missing. I could understand the words, but my somatic sensation upon which the linguistic representation is supposed to be based was missing in the beginning. So I could not understand it. 
So at this stage, the movements to generate the balance ball were not there, so the balance ball was not there. I was not capable of leveraging that law of physics. However, one day, after days of searching, you get the moment of enlightenment and understand things that were puzzling you. Then, all the links are connected from bottom all the way up to the top. Oh, this is it. This is the feeling. And then, I start to understand the representations of my coach. Once this happens, it happens not only with one, but also with everything. In addition, horizontal networks become activated and connected as well. So this and that were not independent. This is possible because that is happening. So there is a horizontal connection in the law of physics, lowering the resistance, meaning lessening the friction. And then you can leverage the law of inertia. And when you have enough lift force, you have enough buoyancy. So everything is connected. And there is a movement to activate all that. And the movements, too, are not independent, like one, two, three, but they are interconnected. Once you get it, you understand how such sensations occur. That is to say, in the lessons, I get taught using words, which are representations and physical movements. Once physical movements link with the material world, the reactions from this linkage become somatic sensations. And once these somatic sensations are felt, the learner finally gets it. This is the model of learning embodied skills. Back to the concept of usufu or mastery of zeami. And I quote, An actor has not yet achieved a fluent mastery at the stage when he is still imitating. This is to say that imitating is not enough. If you are just imitating, you are not there yet. And I quote, when one who imitates his teacher well, shows discernment, assimilates his art, and arrives at a level of perfect fluency, one becomes a real master. This is the state of Ushufu. Actually, by the end of this year, I started taking lessons on the 18th of December 2017, and by the 26th of December 2018, I was pretty confident that I had improved. But then one day, in a different swimming class, this different coach said to me and another student, your swimming doesn't have individuality. Well, this coach was a really nice and kind person, and he said it with a smile, but he was like, Hmm, I can't see individuality in the way you swim. I can't tell who's swimming. Are you going to improve and surprise me soon? He was smiling, but he was saying things like that. And he sounded as if he was meaning, you think you are good, but you are not there yet. And then I told my regular coach, Mr. Fujiwara, what I was told. Of course, I added that it was out of good intention that this coach said it. Well, this is just a side story, but this is what happened. And what happened was this. My coach Fujiwara said, please forget everything you learned. Really? Should I forget everything? And he said, I was swimming better when I let go of everything. And I told a friend of mine about it. And this friend said, oh, it's shuhari. I did not know this term, shuhari. So I looked it up. This is the teaching of Sen no Rikyu, the master of Japanese tea ceremony. And I quote, one must observe the rules, but even if you break them or depart from them, you shouldn't forget the principles. 
守り尽くして、is to keep and protect、破るとも、is have、break and transform、ハナルルトモ is re, detach and transcend. Shu means to learn the basic practice and dedicate to follow the rules and teachings. This is in the context of the way of tea, so at this initial stage, one must follow what the master teaches. The second step is ha step. This is the step to shed one's skin. Based on what one has learned in step one, what one has learned from the teacher, add New elements and make changes to see what works for oneself. So, in a way, this is breaking the form of the master to make it your own. And moving on to the third step, one has the mastery of the basic step, and essence is there as a solid base so one can perform one's own style powerfully with freedom. One is not bound to the basics, but one can perform with freedom and without boundary while keeping the essence. Of the basics. As the last passage of the poem suggests, one must not forget the essence of the basics at all times. This fundamental element is kept at all times, but other elements may be performed with freedom. Learning this concept, I realized that I was still at the stage of shoot, keep, and protect. I was doing exactly what I had been told by my coach. That is why another coach said my swimming had no individuality. I realized that in order to have individuality, I needed to reach the stages of ha or li. This is what I have learned and felt up until the end of last year, which I put together in my paper. And this is something that came up more recently. It was in August during a Zoom happy hour. I shared my experience. And one of my junior colleagues made my story into a four frame comic strip. I was learning back kick. My coach said, No, Miss Enomoto, you need to lift your leg more holding my leg. You are so stiff, you aren't there yet. He's holding my leg and lifting it high, so it looked as if I was drowning. And there were onlookers, these ladies here, worried what was going on. That evening, I happened to have had a ballet lesson. In the spirit of never too late to learn, I started taking ballet lessons again from about two years ago because I used to take classes as a child. There is a pose called arabesque in ballet, like this one. One leg is extended behind the body and one of the arms is extended to the front. I realized that these forms are similar, as in both cases, one leg is lift up to the back. So I asked my ballet teacher what I can do to lift the leg higher, and she said, Mika san, it doesn't work if you are only focused on your lifting leg. Both legs are pulling each other. The standing leg pulls this way, and the working leg pulls the other way. In this diagram, it goes this way and this way. They are pulling to the opposite sides. Not only that, the extended arm should also be pulling. So by all of the elements pulling to the opposite sides, the leg is pulled up too. I thought I got it and gave the back kick a try once again, and I did it. My coach had no idea what happened between the lessons, so he was surprised that I got it overnight. I also did gymnastics back when I was in middle school. Back then, I could not do backflip. Backflip is a backward somersault. During university, I did trampoline, and with the spring of trampoline, I was able to perform backflips. There is a trick in swimming called somersault turn. If you are interested, I found an instruction video on YouTube, and I put the link here. 
you come swimming in backstroke, then you turn like this, and then you continue with breaststroke, as in medley. This term was developed by a person called Somersault, hence its name, sounding like a nice cocktail. One day, my coach Fujiwara proudly showed me this turn. I was like, oh, this is great. And he said proudly, this is called somersault turn. So I searched on YouTube for somersault turn. I found many tutorial videos, and I studied them and tried it in the water the following day, and I did it. Someone who struggled with butterfly so much could perform somersault turn in one go. Coach flew from the other side of the pool and asked me, who taught you that? You showed it to me the other day, and I watched some videos on YouTube, and I said, it's just like backflip, right? And he looked suspicious. Oh, then you were able to perform backflip, and you saw the somersault turn and tried it and did it? What Coach Fujiwara normally says is that seeing YouTube tutorials would not help, so he was just not convinced that I learned it solely from YouTube. But there is another background element here. I had gymnastics background and was able to perform backflip. Now my presentation is coming to an end. Source of learning of a physical skill is not limited in a particular discipline. As we have seen in the example of ballet and swimming, if you can do ballet, you can swim. It makes it easier for you to acquire swimming skills. If you can swim, it makes it easier for you to acquire ballet skills. So I would not specify the combination of disciplines, but learning one physical discipline can lead to the learning of other physical disciplines. It has to do with acquiring how to move the body within the physical laws of the world, because knowing how to move within the laws of gravity, of buoyancy, etc., is very important. All roads lead to Rome. Knowing how to exercise means knowing how to move the body. Knowing how to move your body as you wish is knowing how to exercise and knowing how to work out. This is what Coach Fujiwara said. Getting back to the initial slide, apologies about the fonts, and I am aware that I'm running out of time. I am happy if my reflections can provide some insights to your baby-wearing practices. With this, I would like to close my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Enomoto. I enjoyed it so much. It was very interesting. We have so many questions. But first, I should have warned the audience in advance, and I am sorry for not having done that. There were many questions regarding the relationship between swimming and baby wearing. <laughs> Up until now, we have not had any research shedding light on the process of acquiring baby wearing skills. Uh, Professor Enomoto analyzed in detail the relationship between the learner and the coach on physical skill acquisition. So in this case, it was through swimming, and this is the publication in which you can find her paper. We thought this thorough analysis gives us a lot of helpful insights in considering our baby-wearing coaching practices. Let me start with the most popular question. The use of onomatopoeia. For example, I noticed that you quoted your coach saying shu or swoosh and other onomatopoeia. Does using onomatopoeia benefit the learner? Is it easier to understand? Are there any findings on this topic? Well, onomatopoeia. 
Until the learner gets it, the learner has no clue. This is often the case. Once the learner gets it, once the bulb lights up, then it's all good. So you better not overuse it, but it is certainly helpful, I think. Japanese language has a lot of onomatopoeia, swoosh, whoosh, few, and so on. So as Japanese speakers are used to it, right? Yes. And in the world of linguistics, it is known that Japanese have more onomatopoeia compared to other languages. One student of mine in my lab is comparing the translated versions of Japanese manga with originals, especially in French language, for example. The sounds are analyzed logically and is summed up into one single onomatopoeia. Whereas in Japanese, there are 10 different onomatopoeias for broken glass, or harder glass, and so on. There were this many in the original version, but when it was translated into French, the sound of broken glass was summed into one single onomatopoeia word. So perhaps to have a wide variety of onomatopoeia may be the characteristic of Japanese culture. Okay, then perhaps it's better to use them. Yes, if it makes it easier to communicate. Thank you. Here's a question from Ms. Yana Yukana. You mentioned that even if you were praised, physical sensations are easy to be forgotten. Words can stay in memory if you wrote them down. Now, if the instructor wrote down what was good and gave the note to the learner, or if the instructor took a photo and sent it to the learner after the class, would these efforts benefit the understanding? Or is it something the learner must initiate, in our case, mothers or fathers? Well, in my case, I did not videotape the swimming lessons because I couldn't, but if possible, if the video is available of such moments, then it can help recall the physical sensation rather than being explained verbally or being presented with video may be easier to get it. I think it may help the understanding. Thank you. Next question. The verbal explanation by the coach with Many onomatopoeia and analogies and, for example, the balance ball analogy and the understanding on the part of the learner of the somatic sensation are naturally prone to having discrepancy, is it not? It is only after the learner gets the somatic sensation behind the coach's explanation would these explanations start to have meaning to the learner. So the analogy, whether it is good or bad, some of my fellow learners complain that a particular coach's analogies are difficult to understand. <laughs> so, but in your case, you eventually understood, right? That's right. So once you get it, then the bulb lights up. And even if you don't get it at first, it's stored somewhere in your mind, and it can be a hint one day, and analogy makes it easier to remember. 
バランスボールみたいな。バランスボール<笑>あのスタンプインカーですかみたいな。初めて聞きました。Yes, that was my first time to hear that analogy. So, rather than a detailed explanation, an analogy in a short phrase or word is easier to remember. So, rather than extend your arm, stamp. That's great. And about the discrepancy, The ideal coach can refer to the somatic sensation that the learner has at the point and cater the teaching accordingly. For example, refer to ballet if the learner has ballet background. And it's closer to that sensation or something. And if that can be done, it might be easier for the learner to understand. あなるほど。オッケー。じゃあ、すみません。時間なので最後の質問してもよろしいですか。あの、Q&A Are the learning processes different? In my case, my coach showed me first what I was doing and then showed me what I must be doing. It's sometimes difficult to understand what you are actually doing. But by seeing both ways, it becomes easier to understand. Oh, I'm not supposed to be doing this, so I should do this way. And also, as in mirror neurons, when we see it, our brain is activated in the same way as we are actually moving. So, this is neuroscience, but seeing is a good first step. Okay, so we need both words and vision. Yes, so to teach physical movements, you cannot solely rely on words. Touch is important. Touching the baby is important, and the reaction that you get from it, the soft and cuddly feeling of the baby, those need to be taken into consideration to show how it should be done. Those are necessary. <laughs> Just the fabric is not enough. No stuffed toys. Okay. What was most impressive to me was when the coach said, you got it now, didn't you? We will be practicing more online going forward. And I realized that we need to be more vigilant in noticing the moments where learners are doing the right things and to comment on them. That's right. As we do not get to share the physical space, there are more challenges. That's true. That's right. Well, Professor, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. We really appreciated it. Thank you very much.